Hey, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Pastor Kim Wilcox here inviting you to the table this evening. Uh, we're going to be in session six of our uh, gospel-shaped living uh, Bible study, uh, session six. We're going to talk about being a joyful church in a suffering world. A joyful church in a suffering world. And so as we get <clears throat> started here this evening, uh, we've got uh, just one more week here which will finish out, next week we'll finish out the Gospel Shaped Living. Uh, then we're going to move on to, uh, for the next four weeks, talking about the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, heading to the cross, the journey to the cross. And, uh, and then after uh, we get through that, uh, we will look ahead to uh, Gospel Shaped uh, Evangelism, the Blue Book. Uh, so we encourage you, if you don't have one of those, to go ahead and pick one of those up. Uh, that would be an easy way to get get started uh, with what we have going on. Uh, but anyway, we're in uh, session six this evening. Uh, if you get a chance, if you want to share this on your uh, Facebook page, that would be uh, great this evening. Uh, that'll help others to get in and be a part of the of the Bible study with us. Uh, we're going to be in Habakkuk uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, prophet this evening. So I'm going to go ahead and let you start turning there and uh, getting in that direction. Um, I, I can tell you uh, we'll be on page uh, well, let me see 1478 in my Bible. I don't know how that works with yours. <laughs> but uh, we're going to be in Habakkuk. Uh, we're going to be uh, one stint in Romans chapter 8. And then we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. So if you want to go ahead and head towards uh, Habakkuk in the Old Testament there, uh, kind of go to Psalms and turn right. Uh, that'll get you headed the direction, or you can look in your uh, index in the beginning and, and find out exactly what, uh, what page that would be on there for you. We're going to be in Habakkuk 3, uh, if, that, if that helps you anyway as well. So we're going to talk about a joyful church this evening. Um, Really, prayer concerns, let us pray that uh, we um, really start to begin to comprehend and understand some of these things that we're uh, going through in the Bible study, uh, through uh, the gospel shape of living. Uh, it's exciting to head into the season of the resurrection of Jesus and the importance of what that is for each one of us. And, and uh, so I'm always excited this time of year as we as we move towards that, uh, but then also, you know, we're going to be looking uh, after that into uh, what it'll mean uh, for us with evangelism and being evangelistic and uh, being on a part of an outreach. And so that's going to kind of uh, go right up to the point where we have the Arkansas Mission Team coming to join us in June. Uh, so if you don't have anything going on um, in your world on uh, June 10th through the 17th, we encourage you to come alongside us uh, when the Arkansas Missions Team comes up, and they will uh, join us in our endeavor with uh, uh, reaching the area uh, for Jesus. And um, we'll just go ahead and see what, what direction that, that leads us. Uh, so anyway, I hope you can join us for that. So we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. I'm trying to get this shared on my page. It doesn't, uh, it's a kind of a slow process um, getting that going. But um, let's see if I can get her. Well, maybe not. Um, anyway, we're going. Uh, if you can share this on your page, that would be great. Uh, that'll help us get the message out. Uh, this evening, again, we're going to be in Habakkuk chapter 3. Uh, we're going to talk about a joyful church in a suffering world. And so as we've come along here, we've got to the uh, tonight's session, is session 6 in a gospel-shaped living. Uh, with that, this evening, that gets us to the point of, of kind of learning about ourselves. Uh, the first study we did was about worship. Uh, it was about uh, not coming with preconceived ideas about what worship is, but how we should look at it uh, from a biblical and scriptural standpoint. 
And so the same way tonight as we look at gospel-shaped living, uh, we want to see um, sometimes we already have preconceived ideas about what life is supposed to be about, how we're supposed to do it, and and we just kind of uh, get caught up in what the culture and society has ingrained in us, and that's not always uh, the biblical uh, worldview, biblical perspective. And so we're going to learn more about ourselves and our and our faith in Jesus, uh, really during periods of, of suffering, during periods of trials, uh, during periods of of uh, tribulation that we do in any other times in our lives. Uh, when things are going great, when things don't seem to be at any kind of issue going on in our lives, it's really, uh, we don't depend as much on the Lord as we do upon ourselves. And so that's one of the things that we really need to do on a, on a daily basis is, is depend upon the Lord. Uh, not just in those big, uh, major situations that we have, but in everyday occurrences, everyday things in our lives. And so that's why when it comes to a time of suffering or, or turmoil in our life, we really can look back over a lot of times and see how God has provided for us and how uh, that's been prepared. And really all that comes together because we have really... Uh, intentionally sought him out and uh, we didn't have an answer for whatever the solution might be and so in the midst of that we're always looking then for his guidance and direction and so we we see that come about uh, we live in a broken world uh, life is truly full of of hardships and there's no greater witness to the world today than our witness of being able to come through uh, a difficult time uh, without really uh, having a complicated time doing it, that we really seek the Lord and trust His provision, trust His direction, and trust His purpose in our lives. And so that's a great way to be able to show the world what we really believe in in the Lord. And as we, as we do that, then um, we live in such a world that is falling apart. And when they see something going on in your world, in your life, that doesn't cause uh, great despair and discouragement, uh, they look to you to see how, how you're getting through this. Um, how can we help others to uh, adapt to that thought? And so a lot of times the pain of, of suffering, you know, it comes from uh, losing a job or, or a home. Uh, it comes from financial problems, uh, illnesses. It comes from divorce. Um, it really doesn't matter how rich, pretty, strong, or smart we are. Uh, none of us really escape suffering. And we react to suffering in a lot of different ways. Uh, sometimes we react to suffering through uh, worry, through turmoil, through um, anxiety, through anger. Um, sometimes we even come along to a, a renewed relationship with the Lord as we've come through a time of suffering that's really got us into the point of, of seeking him, and then we really have come to the point of, of finding him in the midst of that. And so that's a, a great way, again, to be able to show others around us. Uh, so the Bible reveals a, another way to look at suffering, and it's a way to look at um, leaning into it, growing through it, and then having joy in the midst of it. And so that's what we're going to look at this evening in Habakkuk chapter 3. I'm going to read 17 through 19. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. It says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, 
and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God, my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me feel like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on in heights. And it's from the, for the direction of the uh, director of music uh, on a stringed instrument. Uh, that's what he's talking about through Habakkuk in there. And so he, he predicts uh, a terrible scenario that's, that's about to happen, uh, that's about to take place. And it's a scenario about a farming community. And yet, even though all the difficult things that took place, everything that happened seemed to be, uh, we would say today, was a bad scenario. Even though all those things took place, he responds with joy. And you think, how can he respond with joy? How can he respond in such a way that uh, rejoices in the Lord? And really, he does it by, by redirecting his attention. He's not looking at the circumstances, but he's looking to his relationship with God. And so in suffering, that's one of the things that we need to remember, that, that God is the one that gives us strength and stability. The obstacle that's in front of you, the mountain that's there, may look difficult. It may look insurmountable. You know, we went, uh, in 2021, we went to, uh, Wyoming during spring break and we went to the Tetons, right? We saw the Teton mountains and, and they are huge. And as you, yeah, as close as we could get because of the snow, you stand down there and you look up and it's just an insurmountable object that's there in front of you. And sometimes those things in our lives, like uh, the losing of a job or house or finances or illnesses or uh, suffering, uh, those things that come about, they seem to be that big in our lives that it's hard to even imagine being able to to navigate over something like that. And so then in the midst of that, we see Habakkuk say that he's going he's gonna to praise the Lord. He's going to rejoice in the Lord. The people will not fall. And so then God offers some saving hope there. The suffering we face now, whatever it is, will eventually end. Now, it doesn't give us all of the answers. We don't know what's all taking place. But God has already done a big thing for us in salvation by letting Jesus come to the earth and, and die for us. Scripture in Romans tells us that nothing can separate us from his love. And, and we can't be destroyed. So God has built this road to eternal joy. And that road goes through the cross and it goes through his son, Jesus Christ. And really the scripture says... In Hebrews 12, but we're to fix our eyes on Jesus for endurance and, and joy. And man, what, a, uh, what essence that would be for us. Because as we stand at whatever obstacle that we're facing today and we look at it, it seems huge. And so we have a choice then to either focus on it or focus on the Lord. And that's going to be a choice that we get to make. Not that we have to make, because in ourselves, if we do it because we have to, we're going to focus on the obstacle. And the Lord is wanting us to focus on Him. And so we need to come to this point of really, you know, evaluating where we are in our gospel-shaped living. True joy cannot be found apart from, a, from an authentic, uh, intentional relationship with the Lord. Now those superficial, Sunday-only, um, prosperity, gospel, 
um, or even legalistic Christianity. None of those things really work. And when the time of suffering comes, uh, unfortunately, we suffer and we don't find joy in it. And so that's why we need to invest heavily, invest primarily in, in a local church community uh, that really believes what is written in God's Word. It's, it's talked about, it's sung about through the songs, it's, it's spoke of with one another. Uh, because we know that the church is a is, is a body of Christ, and we we serve together, we encourage one another, we forgive one another, we love one another, and we experience those things as we grow in our relationship towards Jesus. And so the the joy that we find is not in the circumstance; it's not in the situation, because if that was the case. Uh, we wouldn't find any, right? Because the obstacle would be bigger than that. But in the face of suffering, we're able to find joy because the joy is in the Lord. Scripture says His mercies are new every morning. And so we have something substantial to offer to the world. We have a Savior. And we can say it's a said. I will rejoice in the Lord. I am not going to let the situation, I am not going to let the circumstance be what rules and reigns in my life, even though it could be mighty big, right? And so in this session this evening, we're really looking at uh, the issue of, of suffering, uh, that it's real, that it's true, but in this suffering we find uh, there's a joyful way to suffer in which only Christians can understand right so it's it's a time where we shine bright in a world who needs the light and in a world who is mostly um, that of non-believers and so we can offer support to anyone who who suffers and who needs some help, right? And so it, it's important that we recognize the descriptions of the way people uh, react to different kinds of suffering. And that's one of those things that I mentioned a little bit earlier. You know, we lots of times we become anxious, we become worried, uh, we become stressed, Um and maybe even more so, we become depressed. Uh, sometimes we get angry at God because, you know, how could God who loves me uh, let this happen? You know, I've, I've heard that multiple times. Uh, we become cynical. We become indifferent. And sometimes we think we've done something bad or we've done something wrong to deserve the suffering that we're facing. Lots of people say, uh, even Job's friends would say, if you had a little more faith, you gave a little more money, you blessed somebody else, then you wouldn't have those problems. And scripturally, that's not, that's not true. And so I want you to think this evening, have you ever known someone who suffered well? Now, what I'm saying to that is that they understand that circumstances and issues are, are a part of life. But like Habakkuk, their focus wasn't on the optical, the circumstance. Their focus was on the Lord. I can think back in my real, not real young years, but young years as a, as a married man and... Uh, meeting with a group in, in Bible study and, and uh, had a couple older guys, probably my age then, but <laughs> the older guys in the church that really inputted into the lives of a lot of those young guys back then. And one of them was, uh, his name was Merle. And Merle had a lot of things going on in his life physically that was just unbearable. And yet you never would have known it. 
Uh, he, he never heard it from him. He never complained. He always saw the Lord and everything. And even as he did, uh, he would encourage you in the Lord. And so it was always amazing to uh, listen to him and to, to hear him to share those things. And so those are important things when we start to come to the point of of seeing a, a circumstance in our in our life as we start to uh, face trouble and we say you know problems that go on to think about those who have encouraged us in the past and have helped get through one of those issues in themselves and so the circumstances that Habakkuk faced the circumstance didn't change. Yet he said he was rejoicing in the Lord. And so what's Habakkuk saying is that he has joy even in the midst of, of suffering. And again, like I said, this is possible because he focused on the Lord and not on the circumstance, not on the situation. And so that makes you wonder, what did Habakkuk know about God that makes it possible for him to be able to rejoice? In verse 18 and 19, he says that he, he knows that, that he is the Lord. Verse 18, he says he knows that it is, it is God who has brought salvation. In verse 19, he says that he has given Habakkuk strength and stability in the face of this huge mountain of suffering that's taken place. And so to have joy in suffering, it might mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but it doesn't mean that we're just smiling all the time because we have these terrible situations, circumstances going on in our lives. We're not just pretending that everything is, is okay. And so we don't, we don't treat suffering like it doesn't exist. Instead, we really see that the source of joy is, is God himself. It's, it's God. And so the relationship we have with him now enables us to look forward to what will happen in the future, in eternity. And so our source of joy should always be then God himself. No matter how severe, no matter how troublesome things are going on in our life, it's important to know that nothing can ever separate you from God. No matter how bad the situation gets, you can't be separated from God because of it. And so that's what we need to understand. That's what Habakkuk understood. And so we, we know then that, that God is, is good, right? We know that everything that he brings into our lives then is, is by him to, to help us to grow more like Christ. Now the one thing about God is that we, we know for sure that he understands suffering. He understands pain because in the midst of all the things that went on, Jesus suffered immensely on the way to the cross. He felt pain, he felt suffering, he felt anguish, he felt all those things. And so he, he understands that. And so we know then that, that the Lord is with us in everything that we do, even when we are suffering. And the great thing about the scripture says that one day we'll see him face to face to face. Now, if you're born again believer this evening, we know the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5 17 that we're a new creation, right? The old is gone, the new has come. And one day in the future, 
even what we know now will even be different because what we know now is <coughs> blurred in our imagery, but then we'll see him face to face. And so we look forward to that time where we'll be able to dwell with him forever. God with his people and his people with him. And so then there will be no more mountains, no more obstacles, no more crying, no more pain. All those things in the former life will have truly passed away. But in the meantime, it, it's trying to find joy in the midst of those suffering things. Now, I want you to think about this question too. How, how would you answer the following in a way that points to God's goodness and his sovereignty. And what we hear is that if, if you're suffering, you should pray that God would, would heal you. And that's great to do, but understand that in the Bible, it, it says that God uses suffering in our lives to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. And sometimes he brings about suffering in our lives so that we can come and draw closer to him. We, we lift this up in prayer. And he may not heal us, but he knows what's best for us. And what about this? If, if God doesn't heal you, then that means you don't trust him enough. Well, the good thing about God is that he's not limited by the level of our faith, right? What we can muster up. If God doesn't heal us, it's because he knows that illness is the best way to make us like Christ. And so really saying that is really it's, it's cruel, it's, it's mean, and it's hurtful to those who are who are struggling in a time of, of really suffering. Now granted, suffering is a real time that we should reevaluate our lives, that we should relook at ourselves. But we should urge people and ourselves to trust God when those things happen. And what about this? When life is hard, all you can do is just grit your teeth and get through it, right? Have you ever, you ever heard that? Well, life is, is hard, and that's true. But that statement is very unspiritual. When we suffer as believers, we have the joy of knowing that the pain that we're walking through, no matter how difficult it is, allows us to become more in tune with Christ, who completely understands suffering and what it means to suffer. And we know then the scripture says that God will give us what we need as strength to face the suffering that we're facing. And then what about the one that says, if God loves me, why did I lose my job? Well, we should never judge God by our, by our circumstances. We, we don't need to know all the answers. We do know, though, that in John 3, 16, it says that God not only loves us, he loves us more than anything, and he would send his son to die for us in, in our place. And in that love of God's, he sent him so that we might have life, not death. And so we may never know the real precise reasons about why things happen in our lives, but we do need to encourage one another to trust the Lord's love for all of his people, no matter what happens in our life. 
itinerary thing. I had a friend <clears throat> years ago, and uh, he was almost overqualified for the job, and he went and applied and was just sure he was going to get it. He'd been employed for a while, and and uh, they called back and said, well, no, we can't give you the job because you are really overqualified, and you're not going to stay long, so we're going to hire somebody that's going to stay longer than what we uh, expect you to. Disappointed and discouraged, he, he called me on the phone and he said, I didn't get the job. And I said, <coughs> praise the Lord. He said, praise the Lord, did you not hear me? He said, I didn't get the job. I said, well, that's great because that wasn't the one that God had for you. And now that we know that that's not it, we can pray in another direction to see what he really does have for you. And so it opened up a whole new way of viewing things for him. And shortly he had a job that <clears throat> was uh, in no way uh, what he was qualified for, but God opened the door for him to do what only God could do. So it's a very unique situation. And then we always hear the thing about, well, if, you, if you're suffering, then there must be unconfessed sin in your life. Well, that's true. There might be. You know, that's where we need to reevaluate ourselves at all times. And so sin does have consequences. And, and God does discipline his children when there are sin in our lives. But God brings suffering in our lives at times just for our own purpose and for his purposes. So that those purposes would come in line together. He's loving and good, and so he's not going to punish us un, unduly, right? And so the ultimate example of that is, is Jesus himself. Uh, Jesus was perfect in every way, never sinned, yet he chose for his son to be arrested, beaten, tortured, and then finally put to death upon the cross. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter, the one who denied him repeatedly three times right there before the rooster crowed, and in Acts chapter 2, Peter then goes on to say, this Jesus that you delivered up was according to the ultimate plan that God had, the foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him, but God intended it for, for good, and it was. And so what are some things that we do even in maybe our, our church family that are unhelpful, that are discouraging to people who are suffering. Sadly, we can think of examples just like those that were mentioned. Uh, and instead of helping, it's really discouraging. Sometimes we even avoid contact with someone when we know they're suffering because we don't know what to say to them or, or how they'll respond if we say anything. And then by not saying anything to them, we separate them from the, uh, from the fellowship. Thinking that somebody is just going to pull themselves together and get all straightened out on their own uh, usually doesn't take place. We all know how hard it is to go through and to uh, a time of suffering, a time of turmoil, a time of situations that go on in our lives. And so many times in the midst of that, we, we need one another. And though suffering is unbearable. And so if we're not certain that God knows and that God has a plan in it, then it really does lead us in a path of, of depression and anxiety. And so we need to really spend some time thanking God for his love for us and really understanding what his love really means for each one of us. He, he really does have sovereign care over our lives. And so many times the things that we have go on really are just to get us into a closer walk with him. And sometimes it's not about us at all. <clears throat> it's about how others view us going through the circumstance at the time. And so we really need to ask the Lord to help us to learn how to suffer well. That we trust in his goodness, that we trust in his divine purpose and plan for our lives. 
and pray for those in our body. Pray for those that you know that are that are struggling and, and suffering. And even ask, you know, is there something that God can reveal to you that would help ease those things that, that go along with that? Each day on Facebook, we've pasted and posted, I guess, on there some of the daily devotions that go along with the study. Uh, today's was day three. It's, it's about through the Romans chapter eight, showing how we can cling to six great gospel truths when we face times of suffering. And so if you know somebody this evening that's walking through a time of trial right now, uh, think about asking them to, to join you in, in going through those daily studies. Uh, they're real short, they're real concise, but they're real precise, and they really can help reveal some things in and through us. You can talk with them about it. It can help support them. Uh, and maybe you're the one, and they can help support you. And it gives you a chance to, to pray with one another. And so it's important to remember that, that Jesus' resurrection guarantees us an inheritance that, that never fails. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have suffering and things like that, turmoil, pain in this world that we live in. It means that our future hope means that we can rejoice even if the present time is hard. That's what Habakkuk was saying. I rejoice in the Lord. I might not rejoice in my circumstance. I might not rejoice in my suffering. But oh, how I can rejoice in the Lord. And those joyful traits then show that we, we have faith and trust in the Lord. It causes us to love him more, but then it also allows others to see the light of Christ <clears throat> in us as we face those things on a daily basis. So suffering is not just a difficult question for those who reject the Christian faith, Suffering is problematic for, for believers. Um, those of you that are watching this evening probably understand completely what I'm saying. And so this Bible study this week really helps us to show that, that hey, suffering is, is normal for a Christian too. And so if you are suffering, uh, you're in great company, right, this evening. And if you're not suffering, unfortunately, you might look ahead to a time where you probably will be. And so Christians' view of suffering should be different. It should be viewing through a different set of, of lenses, like these glasses. And if we view that suffering through the lenses of the Lord, it makes all the difference. I don't know about you, but I wonder if you've had a, a time in your life where you might have doubted God because of suffering that went on in your life. It doesn't mean that you love the Lord less. It doesn't mean that he loves you any less either. But the question of God's love and his existence in our lives really is is profound and is proclaimed really during a time of, of suffering and how we respond to suffering. And a lot of times, like I said earlier, Christians can re become really shallow, right, in their uh, regard to younger Christians who haven't felt the, the face of pain and suffering yet. But we need to bear in mind that each one hurts and struggles and suffers in different ways. Now, if we move on over to Hebrews, uh, towards the, the back of your Bible there, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So it's, it's faith. And then 32 through 40. 
in Hebrews chapter 11. And it says, now what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Joseph, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead and raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves, holes and in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Man, some of those things, some of those guys had some terrible things go on. So when we're suffering, you might read that to be um, rejuvenated to the fact that all of a sudden our suffering might not seem quite as bad as what we saw before. And so in that famous passage in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we see the good news of the gospel to people, those who are united with Christ and willing to follow the example of sacrificial service. We find that in Philippians chapter 2 as well. And those verses that we read this evening in Hebrews chapter 11, we see that that is really the norm for a Christian life there will be suffering. It's how we suffer and what we do with the suffering that we endure. So it's, we really need to be encouraged to see the uh, diversity of the different ones, how each one suffered in a way, but yet trusted the Lord's uh, divine hand upon their lives. Those verses in Hebrews show us that God will protect and enable believers to achieve and to do extraordinary things for God. For some of us, and maybe only for a period of time, we're made strong to do great things in the Lord. Think about Daniel in the, in the fire. David, as he was sought after to be killed. Joseph, as he was sold into slavery by his own brothers. And so we can see then that, that God uses some of those things to bring about his glory. So you can think about the different characters in the Bible, the patriarchs, the Old Testament, even those in the New. And their story is really a, a window to us to see and understand what suffering is about, how they endured this suffering, and yet God used them in a mighty way. David is a good example, right? He was, he was incredibly gifted. He achieved great things. But he spent a long time living in a cave in the wilderness, hunted and sought after by Saul. He knew the personal tragedy of losing his best friend, Jonathan, death. He fell into sin himself with adultery with Bathsheba, and then even murdered Uriah, her husband. He faced again the death of the baby that she conceived. 
He was betrayed by his own son, Absalom. And again, cast out. He then lost that son as well. And then he endured long illness as an older man. And what about Mary, right? Jesus' mother. She bore the shame of an early pregnancy out of wedlock. She gave birth to a wonderful son who received signs and gifts. They fled to Egypt as a refugee. At some stage, Scripture doesn't reveal, but she must have lost her husband, Joseph. Some people thought her son had gone mad. He was, he was crazy. And then she watched him die. But yet became a follower of Christ and tradition says served for many years. And so really what enables those believers to go beyond the suffering that they're experiencing and still maintain their trust in the Lord? Well, it's really beginning to trust those promises of God. Believing what God really says is true, and it's not only true, but it's true for them. And that God is near to them, and that he strengthens them, and he, he gives them signs as well. Uh, he brings the dead back to life. And their eyes were fixed on the future not necessarily on the present suffering. And so a lot of times we might think that there's something wrong with us because we're experiencing these things. We might think that God is punishing us because of some particular sin that's in our life. Sometimes we might even feel that God has abandoned us, that he, that he doesn't even hear anymore. And it can even become so severe that we can get to the point where we believe that God doesn't even exist. That our faith is futile and that our foundation is shaken. And so we need to really be careful with how we view the things that go on in our lives. That we would realize it's not a sign of ungodliness but a sign of God working in our lives to draw us closer to him to help us become more Christ-like. That we would know that even though we might face these unfortunate times, suffering is a built-in part of the life of Christ. When we say that we're going to follow Christ, that means in all ways, which also means in suffering as well. In verse 40, it shows those Old Testament believers trusted God's word more than they trusted the evidence of the suffering that they were experiencing. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 again says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So we're to throw off those things that encumber us. Throw off those things that weigh us down, our, our doubts, our fears, our love for the things of this world. And we're to run with endurance as as disciples of Jesus, as followers of him, just like he commanded us to do. And remember that this is a normal pattern of life for Christians. But it's through suffering that we find glory. And that's a pattern that's revealed fully in Jesus. And so we're to look to him. And so Jesus really went through much greater suffering than most of us will ever experience 
in our lives, uh, the physical pain of the cross, the emotional pain of the betrayal and abandonment. We're just a part of it. The spiritual pains of bearing the sins of the world would have been appalling to the Son of God. Yet because of his love for us, he endured all of those things so that we might have an opportunity for salvation today. And so the joy of eternity is really a promise from God that enables us through Jesus, through testing, through suffering, to be able to come to him. And so Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father. ruling in heaven. But he suffered greater than we suffer today. And so when we speak about him, about suffering, we need to understand then that he understands pain. He understands our pain. So fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing means that we're to fix, we're to Un unwaver, were to gaze, were to be determined not to look anywhere else, not even at whatever's causing us to suffer. It's Jesus that we're following, not the situation, not the suffering, not the pain. So we're going to be determined not to look anywhere else. Knowing that Jesus' life teaches us, it shows us his character and helps us to become more like him. And able to know Jesus, we go through these things, but we trust him because his word says that through him we can persevere. So we take our eyes off of those things that are around us. And so no, it's not a quick fix. Suffering, unfortunately, can last for years. And we need to help one another not to succumb to the temptation of giving up or being discouraged or <clears throat> not trusting the Lord. We, Unfortunately, when we have a long-term suffering or something is going on, we, we grow weary. Things grind us down. And we lose the focus on Jesus and we lose the glory of the Lord. And soon we start becoming faint-hearted. We lose the energy to become and to continue to be a follower of Christ. We may still go to church. We might be going through the motions. We might be singing the songs. We might be saying all the right things. But inside we're devastated. Our heart's not really in it. And so really we're just a shell of what a Christian is really supposed to look like. <clears throat> and we're in danger of crumpling under the seriousness of the suffering that we're experiencing. And so it's important that we keep encouraging one another and ourselves to look to Jesus and to trust him. Remembering heaven is something that we find especially hard, really, in the, in the West. We've got so much that heaven seems distant. We, we have so many things. We have so many possessions. And so we need to keep disciplining ourselves to know that this is not our home. We're just a passing through. We're aliens in this land and that our final destination is eternity in heaven. And so if you're battling with depression, if you're battling with some of those things, go to those scriptures in Hebrews and see what others have experienced as well. If it's financial, if it's job, 
maybe wayward children, maybe even ailing parents or, or grandparents. Support is there and encouragement, and that's really the one of the important things about the body of Christ, the, the church. Don't just talk to people who will give you the answers that you're looking for. Ask God about the situation and trust his promises. He, he shows us the saving work of Christ on the cross. And so if you really need something to encourage you this evening, as we close out here, I encourage you to read Psalms 23. If you're suffering for whatever reason this evening, take heart in that. It points to the ultimate care of the good shepherd. So things, be reminded that things hinder and trip us up when we're not running the race well, when we're focusing on the wrong things. So do your faith some encouragement and, and focus on the Lord. And you can flourish even in the face of physical or emotional or relational suffering, maybe even persecution. And so you really need to spend some time praising God for allowing you to have a Savior. For his perseverance in the suffering that he endured on the way and through the cross that opened up a door that we might have life. And that God would prepare in you that even the suffering that you're experiencing something will bring glory to him. And then another thing we can always remember that there are other brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that are facing real persecution on a daily basis. And pray that those who are persecuted would continue to, to trust Jesus and to be able to share and that their life might bring glory to God in some way, shape, or form. That he might look, that those that see them might look to the Lord and see the difference. So we're going to close out there next week. It's the final session in Gospel Shaped Living. How to be the church in the world. And that's what we're going to look at Sunday morning this week and as well as next Wednesday. And then after this, we're going to journey to the cross as we go through Resurrection Sunday on April 9th. So again, if you've got something going on you need prayer for, be sure to let us know. Message, text, email us, whatever it does to get us a message that we can be praying for you. Take a look at Psalm 23 this evening. Look at the last part of Hebrews 32 through 40 or so, uh, chapter 11, to see what others had experienced in themselves. And like always, we always give you an opportunity to be able to share in the ministries at North. Uh, you can do that through uh, giving through Generosity by Lifeway app. You can mail a check to the church, put a tension to lend on it, or you can uh, come and join us any Sunday morning and drop it in the offering plate. We'd love to have you visit in person, uh, be a part of our presence, and continue to uh, praise God for what he's doing in all of our lives. <coughs> so as we close out here this evening, uh, we pray that you have a great rest of your evening. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again. Uh, again, if you need something, be sure to let us know. So we sign off here tonight saying we love you and God bless.